Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Timur Husnutinov, co-founder of Integrate Cal Community Partners Benefit Corporation, or we will call it ICCP for short. Lee Welter, a Sacramento physician, uh, and John Cameron, author of Rewire, Rekill, and Development Officer at Pacific Legal Foundation. Welcome to the show. We're on uh, Cable Channel 17 in Sacramento. We're on YouTube. We're on the web at www.access to Sacramento at 8 p.m. Thursday, noon, Friday, and 4 a.m. Saturday. Tell your friends. The phony war on drugs. Why is the war on drugs phony, John? Well, the... the Something is phony if if it's uh, presented as one thing and is actually another. You know, like if I said uh, I'm a medical doctor, but if I was uh, not a medical doctor, that would be phony. So the war on drugs is presented as a way to stop drug use, but actually, what the war on drugs uh, is uh, underlying and its real purpose is to um, employ a number of corrections officers, police officers lawyers, judges, all the rest of that, keep them fully employed, and funnel money into the hands of drug cartels. Now, if this was not the case, and, and the, uh, the real um, purpose of the war was to stamp out drugs in this country, then the policies that have actually done all these things, but not touched the level of drug use in the country, would have been thrown out years ago and replaced with something else. So. What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again um, and expecting different results. So it's obvious then that the stated goal of the war on drugs is simply a smokescreen for what's really happening. Because after 40 years of doing something... 40 is 140. Well, 100. In I mean, California, it's, it's 97 years since yeah. the... Poison yeah. Act, 1913. Amendment. So there's, but, but it's really, I mean, they've really thrown serious, serious money at it over the last 50 years. Now, um, so again, uh, if, if you keep, uh, if you're saying, I want to make myself well by hitting myself in the head with a hammer, and you keep waking up with a concussion, what any rational person would do would stop hitting themselves in the head with a hammer. So, um, and it's, it's really funny because the spin on the war on drugs is, if you look at any decriminalization of marijuana, which we're going to talk about at, at length, I think a little bit later, um, who's come out against it? Uh, peace officers, uh, prosecutors, uh, um, uh, corrections officers, all the people who have a vested interest in keeping their jobs. And the drug cartels, of course. And the drug cartels, of course. With under, where, the, with under the counter money yeah, to, well, to fund the campaigns. So. Right. Well, you anyway, know, think about it. If, if, let's use a conservative number. That conservative number is $50 billion a year in drug profits around the world. But it's probably more near 100 billion. Um, let's say that the it is that lower number 50, and let's say that these drug dealers can't figure out a way to clean half of it, so they just burn half of that 25 billion dollars in a bonfire to stay warm in Colombia, <laughs> and then they they wash the rest of it in cash-based businesses throughout the world, now, like a restaurant that has six customers but somehow declares a million dollars in profit. Uh, look at Humboldt County, folks. Just look at some of those restaurants. Um, so, what's, what $25 billion does in investable money, because once it's cleaned out the other side, it can appear in your bank account and use it to buy real things, like stock in companies, uh, or senators, or representatives, or judges. Well, you mean they make donations to the, the Corrupt Politician Foundation that does great things around the world, especially yes. for themselves? Yes, yeah. So, the, the war on drugs is phony. I don't know who said it recently. But it was in the news, if you ever want to increase something, um, declare war on it. You know, like the war on poverty, we have more poverty. The war on crime, we have more crime. The war on drugs, we have more drugs. What we have is more people profiting off of it. And, and if, you will, if you will get an honest police chief or sheriff anywhere and ask them why they're against um, legalizing harmless and beneficial drug in many cases, because marijuana is actually very, very beneficial to many people, um, they'll tell you, if you, can, if you can get the truth out of them, that it's because um, they'll lose a ton of their budget, won't need a ton of their cops, and they'll have to lay off a whole bunch of police people. 
However, there's a great organization, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, L-E-A-P. And you can do a search on that. You'll get all kinds of background information. Which I'm guessing represents a minority of the police community. <laughs> well, the ones that are maybe retired or yeah. got wise enough that they, yeah. they couldn't go along with the Yeah, uh, the and program. I mean, all you have to do is look at the history of drug usage. Prior to drugs being made illegal back in the 19th century, uh, opiates were used by a couple, three percent of the population yes. in the form of patent medicine, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, approximately two, three percent of the, of the yeah, population uses opiates. And it might now. be even higher now because you've got more, more, more drug pushers. But, but if I may add to the economic argument, too, um, when all of this stuff started happening, specifically regarding cannabis and opiates uh, with the Poison Act of them in 1913, uh, <laughs> at that time, pharmaceutical companies, especially in California, they were actually making chemical derivatives and components of uh, the cannabis flower into some of their proprietary uh, medications. And they were originally against prohibition, but with, with sensationalism, um, a, a racialized view towards, towards drug use, uh, people like William Randolph Hearst publishing uh, sensationalist art articles about this kind of stuff. With timber interest to protect, so he didn't want hemp to be grown. Right, right. Uh, all of this stuff started gaining more social acceptance, but it dropped off before the World War II. And then once again, uh, when World War II was won by the Allies, people kind of started getting bored and they thought, I mean, this is another great area we can uh, return to and put more prohibitions. And then they really ballooned with Nixon and uh, um, Who was trying Reagan. to take, take the spotlight off of right. Watergate. But 97 and, years in California specifically, uh, and, it's, and it's not all based on economic interests. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, a lot of it has to do with race. And one of the things we're trying to do now is to restore those race relations, saying, like, it shouldn't be about this, right? It, no, there I, should be... When you talk about race, um, I agree on that point. If, if you're the... the Drug laws as they are now, um, the people who are most harmfully affected by it are young black men. If you're a young black man, you have, well, if you're a black man age, once you turn 18 until like in your 40s, you have a one in three chance of be, being in prison. So um, that's a wonderful statistic, and basically it is all about the drug laws. Um, it's it's all about the drug laws. Uh, you, you, know you, the, look at, you look at they're, they're either in jail for possession or sales or whatever. And, you know, you can throw failed schools in there. They don't have any skills because they've never been taught and they're not held accountable because of the failure of, of government monopoly schools in their areas. So they have no choice but to turn to something where they can try to make a little money. Oh, let's sell drugs because drugs are illegal. If they weren't illegal... They wouldn't have the ability to sell them because, as we know, weed can grow in a ditch somewhere. So it's not... Hence the nickname. Yeah, weed. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, weed growing uh, pretty much anywhere, with the move to decriminalize or, in fact, uh, quasi-legalize uh, marijuana in particular, uh, it's uh, turning into a big industry. And, uh, Tim, your, uh, your uh, Integrate Cal Community Partners Benefit Corporation, or as we will henceforth call it, ICCP, uh, is involved in uh, consulting on that. Uh, tell us exactly what you're up to. Yes, it's a very interesting time indeed. Um, the estimates for uh, revenues regarding uh, legalized income from cannabis, which is the preferred term to marijuana, uh, marijuana has roots to a racialized viewpoint, uh, starting with marijuana, loco weed, and Indian hemp. So we don't prefer to use those terms in the industry. Gunge is okay there? Uh, nicknames, uh, we're trying to so do the scientific cannabis, route. Cannabis. We're not going to write ganja into the policy. Oh, Let's okay. just say that. Yeah. It's going to be cannabis, cannabis, cannabis sativa um, in cannabis particular. Cannabis sativa. Um, but the issue, what's been, what's been happening is uh, uh, we're seeing that the communities of concern, different constituent groups, aren't being consulted regarding this. There's a lot of uh, business interests, a lot of... Um, uh, specialization uh, with people from lots of capital coming in so we decided to create this this company it's the first and to my best ability in research the only uh, for-profit benefit corporation that's focusing on consulting between the public and private sectors in the state of California um, we've been around for six to nine months now depending on what date we're going to use uh, for that and uh, we're primarily focusing right now on uh, Yolo County Sacramento County and Davis City um, and we're having a lot of success there. So it's, it's, it's a, ch a chance to champion 
um, community development strategies, in a sense also restorative justice, but also looking to the economic well-being of these uh, rising entrepreneurs, both small, medium, and large. So, so we're trying is, to be like the gatekeepers between all of the different entities. So is part of your business model to uh, make it possible for people in legal marijuana, uh, or I'm sorry, cannabis uh, production or uh, sales businesses to work within the confines of local regulations? Yes, that, that'd be a good way to put it. That's one of the things we do. Um, and we've been having uh, great signs of success uh, in places like Davis. Um, and, and the more that this happens, the momentum that's going to build behind it, then uh, people will actually have a choice between huge groups um, um, you know, like Green Rush Consulting, some of these big partnerships with lots of, uh, lots of capital to invest in, to us who are more localized, look out for the little guy. Um, and uh, there's a lot of interest for places, communities like Davis in particular, maybe not cities like Oakland, which are just trying to commercialize everything, really. We even had some people come from Oakland over here inquiring about business interests, but we want to serve the local communities first. I could, I, I'm eager to learn more about your enterprise, Tim, but mm -hmm. before we go too far down the path, I want to mention there is an excellent publication that negates the popular propaganda against cannabis and other illegal drugs. It's titled Chasing the Scream. You can go online, chasingthescream.com. It's written by Johan Hari. And uh, you've heard the statement, uh, what we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. What do we learn from alcohol prohibition? For one thing, when you repeal it, the violent crime rate drops and plummets very, very dramatically. Uh, the gangs that want to control territory have no legal way to enforce their contracts other than on their, using their own uh, force. I guess the monopoly on force is sort of broken down, I guess. Real politicians might not be happy with that, but... Uh, no, we definitely they're... have a lot of solid statistics to draw from, even places like Portugal and Uruguay. Um, Portugal yeah, really they, well. the, uh, the, the police, the, the uh, enforcement establishment there, so mm -hmm. to speak, uh, most of them were against those policies. And a couple of years down the road, once those policies prove to be successful, they're totally mm -hmm. on board. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a matter of time. To Are they get... totally on board with a smaller workforce? <laughs> I, I'm not sure, but okay. they are totally on board with all the statistics showing yeah. uh, reduced rates of crime. Well, that's uh, the same thing that's happened in Colorado and Washington State. Uh, since, Colo uh, we prefer the Colorado model over Washington State. Washington has a lot of uh, issues regarding the divide between medical and uh, adult use. Cannabis. Okay, let's talk about the best sustainable uh, pathways for uh, drug policy reform, uh, both medical and uh, recreational, uh, particularly in regard to cannabis. So, basically... What we're trying to do is engage communities of concern, as I said before, uh, but not necessarily overburden them with um, these business encroachment interests uh, or, or entrepreneurs coming from outside of uh, localities to kind of invest and take all of the uh, possibilities of development away, right? So we're trying to balance all those interests. Um, a lot of things that we've been seeing that are, are, are good to, uh, in, a, in a word, sell to local communities, um, governments, public sector specifically, um, harm reduction policies, um, networking through groups like Students for Sensible Drug Policy, um, even teaming up with libertarian groups like Young Americans for Liberty. Um, I know there's a lot of stigma within the libertarian circuit regarding social justice warriors, right? But what we're trying to do is, one of the things we're doing is, is championing uh, restorative justice for youth programs. And even the Davis City Police Force is for this. Instead of just uh, arresting people, they're detaining them. They want to uh, funnel them through these uh, new programs by the city and county level and give them the education that they need. And, and, and really be like a slap on the wrist, but a, as an informative one, instead of just incarcerating them. Um, and we're, if Are you talking about uh, arrest for drug possession, that sort of thing? Yeah, that kind of stuff. So the drug court, right? But approach. but 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 they're well, not necessarily. We're not trying necessarily. to we're trying to put some of the emphasis and the money going to cannabis into these like give back techniques to the community. Mm -hmm. And once you meld that together, then all of a sudden, um, uh, municipalities and counties start to agree with some of the more reasonable uh, regulatory pr uh, proposals that we have, right? So we were having some success with Davis there. Just just going down like the Oakland route and focusing primarily on capital is not going to do it for California. California wants to be different, right? So we have to cater to those kinds of interests. There's one facet that I think is very, very important, and that is countering the propaganda. 
Sorry. And I'll try to briefly address one facet of that. Um, we've probably read or heard about the rats that are confined to a cage that are given the choice between drinking water or drinking water with a drug in it, cocaine, cocaine for example. And those rats prefer the cocaine by far. However, a very um, insightful experimental psychologist developed what he called rat park. Instead of in a very confining cage, he built a large cage with multiple rats, entertainment toys for the rats and wheels to run on and a, a normal rat lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Some rat libraries, right. a little rat gym. <laughs> Yeah. Equivalent, yeah. put it that way. And they still have the drips house. there. And they, have, they yeah. have their choice between water and the drug. Even the addicted rats chose the water because they didn't need the drug anymore. It mm. is a mental health yeah. problem. Yeah. And that's what needs to be addressed. Absolutely. That's why one of the serious things we have to consider is not going down the Washington State route, which is folding the medical cannabis sector into the uh, totally for-profit and uh, adult use recreational sector. Mm -hmm. We have to make it clear that, yes, cannabis does help a lot of people, and we have to protect that that area of the industry and, and differentiate it from the uh, upcoming adult use industry. Um, so if, if we let them fuse together, a lot of constituencies are going to get lost and there's going to be more misinformation and more assumptions being made about it. Uh, and we want to we we take the lead on the education components. And I'm guessing less uh, uh, good advice from dispensers of medical uh, uh, cannabis uh, as to what's good for what and how to use it, et cetera. Absolutely, yeah. We had a lot of them testify at a recent um, city council and hearing meeting in Davis. Um, and uh, the, the, the people are more, um, both on the council and the staff and, and, the, and the public are more perceptive and, and sympathetic to those voices um, than just any old business interest coming in. So yeah. the balance is really important. Yeah, yeah. and I, I favor. I'm still a licensed physician, and uh, though I'm not active in clinical practice, I keep up with medical education, including an educational uh, program on cannabinoids and their, their benefits. And one thing that struck me is if you heat marijuana, smoke it, you produce at least 2,000 different compounds. And who the heck knows what those compounds are going to do, whereas if there are specific as, um, extracts it, they can be purified and used for a particular um, remedy or ailment, there's a real benefit. But we don't want to break down that barrier. At least I don't favor right. breaking down that barrier. Let the, let the medical researchers do their stuff. Well, fact, that, that's another thing, opening up research opportunities. Yeah. Uh, instead of having the feds or even sometimes state authorities block all of those attempts. Well, research. yeah, right now the only medical uh, research, uh, quote unquote, that can be done has to be done with uh, uh, a cannabis is grown by uh, a, a medical uh, uh, pot farm someplace in Mississippi. And I'm uh, guessing they probably don't have the, the highest quality strains there. <laughs> no, yeah, they, they don't have all the information. They're very constrained as to what they can do. And, and, and most of these government back studies to show the ill effects of cannabis are rigged so that you can't depend on that kind of information. No. Well, and, and, UCs want to get into their research floor, and, and UC Davis could be a great one for that too. Well, let's go back to that phony war. Uh, if if the, all the benefits, all the benefits uh, that studies throughout the world have shown about cannabinoids, about cannabis, even for uh, people with some very serious illnesses, going through chemo and radiation therapy and nausea, um, just you know, ingesting cannabis, even smoking cannabis has shown tremendous benefits, but. Because that research is discounted in the United States, the only research that, that is allowed to be considered is research that the rigged research that comes out of using bad cannabis grown in Mississippi. I'm not saying they don't grow some great cannabis in Mississippi, but not in that place they don't. So, um, How do you know, John? Um, based upon my intensive Googling of the subject, I, see. Uh, I can honestly say that... Uh, let me let me just skip that, that, that question. And go into <laughs> I, could, I could I could deflect that just a little bit. Thank you. I used okay. to work I used to work in hyperbaric oxygen therapy, which has tremendous benefits. But uh, some of the potential benefits have been highly discouraged by research, clearly probably funded by the pharmaceutical industry, 
they don't want an affordable, effective cure for problems like uh, frequent seizures or or brain injuries or the like. They want to treat it with their little pills. Mm. Little uh, pills are high profit. Yeah. Well, Especially no if you well, have, I mean, uh, if you have that's a another player. On the that's another. Pill. That's yeah. another player in the anti uh, cannabis legalization yeah. effort, yeah. which is is the pharmaceutical companies. Not right. the entire pharmaceutical industry. Parts of it. Some exactly. of them are actually looking forward to it, so that they they can get an end yeah. and they can start doing their yeah. own thing, which is a huge fear. And uh, that's in a lot and of that's not to say all the pharmaceutical companies are bad guys. Yeah. There's certainly, there's a lot of benefit to be had, but when they put their thumb on the scales, it's, mm. it's not. Not well, right now. well now that we're moving in, in a direction, I think 60% of the American public is in favor of uh, uh, cannabis hydrogen. being uh, legalized at all, all, for all purposes, medical and recreational. What is the most realistic way uh, of dealing with, and do we have to deal with, uh, taxation, regulation, et cetera, of, of uh, legalized uh, uh, cannabis as well as other drugs perhaps coming down the pike? Yeah, um, Richard, unfortunately, uh, one of the biggest selling points, especially for uh, the liberal establishment in California, is the huge promises of gigantic uh, tax revenues. Um, and they're trying to put it into the city, the county, and the state level. So everybody, all, every politician has their hand on the, on the tap. Not everybody, but the, the ones who want to profit from it um, do. Some of them do it altruistically, <laughs> like supporting those, those uh, decriminalization, legalization measures. Others have like the, 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 the eyes on the prize. And um, yes, we have to. That one of the like next few things we're going to do in California and the places like Colorado, although they have already begun on this process, is to kind of reform and redefine these regulatory taxation issues. Make sure that it's not too burdensome, um, because what ends up happening in some case studies um, is that when you have too much taxation through all the levels of government, all of a sudden people who are not necessarily being treated for medical issues. Right, but just love to enjoy um, cannabis recreationally. They see, you know what, the black market prices are, are superior. Mm. Are and there's, lower. Are you know, lower yeah. because yes. there's so many hurdles like this, uh, barriers to purchase uh, a reasonable price product. Um, and we can't do that. In the, because in, in, regulation r drives the price up. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so we have, to, we have to have a balance to this. We can't just get crazy with all of this taxation and then basically ruin the market before it even really has a chance. Well, is there any argument for, uh, uh, for uh, taxing? Uh, cannabis at any other rate that any other product is sold for. In other words, just a you know a, a straight just sales tax. Another commodity. <laughs> well, yeah, there's going to in California. There's going to be uh, excise taxes on the um, recreational product, the adult use product, but not at what percent? Uh, I don't have the figure right now. Okay. Um, but uh, I think there is a figure written into the state law. But there is additional components that the localities, um, cities, and counties will have to decide on. Um, and a lot of them are looking upwards, uh, mm -hmm. higher rates. So when you start stacking all that stuff together, mm -hmm. I mean, you look where the money is going. A lot of it's for education programs, uh, not not the general fund, but uh, specific uh, specific funds within the state level um, that can't be unfrozen for about 10 years, a decade. Mm -hmm. um, that was written in to kind of like guarantee that the, there was transparency with the money, right? But the, the tax rates themselves are going to hurt the little guys. Mm -hmm. um, so how can a collective, a medical uh, dispensing, uh, medical cannabis dispensing collective um, make enough profit to justify what they're doing once the new laws go through if they're so burdened like in uh, Santa Cruz in the last five to ten years? Um, uh, most of those city, um, most of those dispensaries within the city actually had to close their doors. They were so overburdened by this taxation, by all the regulatory hurdles that the city was trying to throw at them. So now most of them exist in the county space, and there's only one left in the actual city. That tells you something. They had over a decade to figure this out, and yet their model hasn't been working. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen places like Davis. So, so, the so, so you've got you've got a, a laughter curve at work here. You can tax at a hundred percent and get nothing. You can tax <laughs> at zero percent and get nothing. Somewhere on that curve is the uh, correct amount of taxation, not to mention regulation. Right, and we're going to be dealing with that for for quite some time. Yeah, and uh, well, where is the sweet spot? Zero. <laughs> zero percent. <laughs> no, 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 no. There has to be some guaranteed tax rates uh, to appease some parties, like on the state level. Yeah. But the less that there are on the local levels, the better, unless, of course, you're putting 
uh, our strategies, like ICCP strategies, to use and have these uh, youth restorative justice programs, then you can kind of justify a little bit more because the people have shown that they're willing to pay for those initiatives, but not things clearly marked, not things that uh, actually deserve that kind of funding. Different groups in the liberty movement, libertarians and conservatives, and uh, you know, different different uh, different group liberals for that matter, different groups of people have different ideas about yeah. how this whole uh, uh, liberalization of cannabis and other drug laws should go forward. What's the best way for, in particular, liberty-minded groups, libertarians, to work with others, play well with others in making the whole project work without a whole lot of hiccups? From my experience, transitioning um, primarily from uh, uh, positions of leadership within the California um, and West Coast liberty scene, specifically through groups like Young Americans for Liberty, um, I, I kind of got discouraged with what was happening this, this past um, 12 months or so. Uh, not enough resources are being dedicated uh, to our efforts here. Uh, California, I think, is a vital state with a lot of libertarians and potential libertarians, like in, uh, or liberal-tarians for that matter, like a Berkeley or conservatarians, all of these different flavors, right? Uh, the way I got around it was focusing on, on the big picture, uh, kind of like a big tent approach, as they used to say. So for cannabis, uh, everybody knows libertarians have been for uh, decriminalization and legalization. Libertarians right? just want to have fun. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Freedom. But right to have maximize the freedom of individuals. Yeah, yeah. But that doesn't. And there's so so much propaganda. They should say, "Oh, we'll be legal." Well, alcohol is legal. Do, does that mean we have people walking to work with a bottle of uh, beer or, or trying to sell there? you a bottle outside exactly. the store? Exactly, doesn't happen. No, it yeah. doesn't well, work that no, way. No, I work downtown. Yeah, you have people <laughs> walking to work with a bottle of beer. Well, I thought yeah. I think I should well, well, no, they're walking to flasks don't count, right? They're walking to non-work because they're they're getting back to the subject at hand. You were saying. The open-ended side of things, I have found that when I'm limiting my uh, uh, argumentative points and kind of libertarian attitude with all of these different groups, specifically ones on the left, right, then there's a lot more consensus on what we have to do. Um, sure, I would like to speak up more about um, regulatory issues, right, or free market issues, but basically, for the most part, we kind of agree on what we need to do right now. Um, and that has been a market improvement over condensing people who have already made up their mind on other policy areas. And I truly believe, and I know a lot of libertarians do too, that uh, drug legalization and ending the war on drugs is the single most useful policy movement we can potentially put our time into. The, the ramifications for, for changing the way we've done things for 100 years are huge, international in scope. In terms of the benefit to society as right, a whole. Right, benefit society, individual, economic, yeah. everything, right? Yeah. There's not, like, changing the president, having a, a libertarian president would be wonderful, but it wouldn't accomplish as much as ending the war on drugs and liberalizing but the... But uh, having right? a libertarian president might help end the war on drugs. Might help, but yeah, yeah we, we can't overestimate uh, the, the power of the presidency in regards to these sorts of policy issues. Um, we'll talk about some other issues too, in, in, in particular drug decriminalization on another show uh, as, as, as it affects a civil asset forfeiture, uh, a bugaboo of mine. That's the show for this week. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place at uh, Channel 17 Sacramento and uh, YouTube and uh, accesssacramento.org. Thank you very much for being part of the show. Thank you.